Oh, wasn't that beautiful? I'm sorry, they only sang one song. Perhaps they're going to sing in the, uh, in the program, the concert that's going to be happening, and they'll sing more than one song. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I always enjoy hearing, uh, hearing the choir. Just a beautiful, beautiful number. So good to see you uh, this afternoon. I, I like uh, Barry, wish I could speak those languages that I see before me. Uh, representation. The only thing I know is for my Fijian brothers and sisters, Bula. That's all I know. <laughs> Bula Bula. That's all I know. Um, but it's so wonderful to see you all and many of you in cultural dress and attire. And that's wonderful. Uh, so many beautiful colors. Isn't it good to just be together? Yeah. Oh, you don't sound like you're happy to see anybody today. <laughs> Let me try it again. Turn up your hearing aid. Isn't it great to be together? Yeah. Oh, that's that's good that's good yes that's that is what convocation is all about isn't it somebody asked me I told them I said I'm going this afternoon to speak uh, at the convocation they said what is that and I said well you know it's just and I was trying to describe it as a worship service I said you know what it's just us getting together it's just us getting together who are like-minded, even though we are uh, maybe different backgrounds, different culture, different experiences. We all, though, are God's children, aren't we? And it's such a blessing to be together with the people of God. For as Jesus has said, where, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of those people. And so we have the presence of God with us as a people. I want to thank you for the work that you do in your churches and in your ministry around this conference. I, I didn't know that you had a record, uh, Pastor Lim, a record baptism, a number of baptisms this year. And I think when you said that, I was the only one that said amen. <laughs> I was in my section. I was the only one that said amen. But that means precious souls. So I wonder if I can ask this question. Is there anyone here sitting here today that you were baptized into the seven-day Adventist church this year? Can I see your hand? You were baptized into the seven-day Adventist church this year. Praise the Lord. I see a hand there. I see a hand here. I think I see a hand back here. Oh, standing up and holding up. Yes, praise the Lord. Give them a big hand. Yes. And I wanted to say that because it's not just about numbers. It's about lives. It's about people being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and who have made a decision that Jesus is their personal Lord and Savior. Isn't that wonderful? I know many of you have been Seventh-day Adventist Christians for a lot of years, and so it's, it's no big thing to you anymore. It's no big thing to you. You're old hat, you know, you're old time Seventh-day Adventist, so you may not remember those special moments, but... Um, I know there's some of you do, and I remember my special moment. I was just eight years old. I was eight years old, and, and um, I remember, in fact, um, um, I have my, I still have, anybody still have your baptismal certificate? Did anybody hold on to your baptismal certificate? Let me see your hand if you still, if you know where it is. Okay, some of you know where it is. I still have mine from April, and I remember the date. Do you remember the date when you were baptized? You do. Pastor Lim, what was the date you were baptized? Do you remember? It was December 26, right after Christmas, 1981. I've got you beat. <laughs> I got you beat. I got you beat. Anybody baptized before 1981? Let me see your hand. You were baptized before 19... They got you beat. Look at all of these Adventists. Long before you were Adventists, they were already baptized. All right. Can anybody beat April 9, 1975? Well, look, she's got me beat. That means you're old. You're old. 
Amen. <laughs> 19, I was baptized April 8, 1975. Wow. I was just a little young man. Don't, don't get it. Don't, don't, don't think I'm old. I'm just... <laughs> I was just a little boy. You're talking about children's ministry. That was children's ministry. I was just a little, a little baby boy. So it's amazing that there's so many things that, that you can forget in life, right? But you don't forget when you came to Jesus and when you were baptized. And I can even remember the pastor who baptized you, right? You don't forget the pastor who baptized you. I was such a bad little kid. He held me under the water a little extra longer. <laughs> But you'll never forget. You'll never forget. And that's what makes us a part of the family of God. And it's so good to see you today and to be a part of that family. I love it. I bring you greetings from your conference, which is the Northern California Conference, 40,000 plus members. And we have uh, all of the different languages and nationalities and cultures. I love this conference. And you are are a part of that and we thank you for what you're doing uh, in the work of God. I don't want to hold you too long because I know there's music coming and then I also know there's going to be a good potluck coming. And it's so hard to preach when you have when you're up against a potluck. It really is tough. Especially, I mean, I've been to almost every one of your churches and every one of you have a good potluck. And to see all of us together and a potluck, wow, that's heaven. That is heaven. So I'm not going to be very long. Um, here's a, a passage of scripture that is very familiar to you. It's Revelation. What book did I say? Revelation, all the way to the end of the Bible. Revelation, beginning at verse 6. In fact, I'm just going to read two verses. Verse 6 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 14, and ver beginning at verse 6. And then I will read also verse 7. And here is what John the writer saw. He says, then I wrote. He says, then I saw another angel. Another what, everybody? Angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who would dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this holy convocation. We have gathered from the east and the west, the north and the south, to be together at this point. To just in many ways, bask in your goodness. And to be able to say it was a privilege to be in your presence and to be here, to come through a people. We have, in essence, come through great tribulation ourselves. We've come through a worldwide pandemic and we're here. But our mission has not changed. Our love for you has not changed. It has, our passion has not waned because we are your church and we are your people and we're grateful. Now speak, Lord. Give us a word that would encourage us as we move forward in faith, as we move together in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you can imagine what it would have felt like. Some of you probably could think about this. Um, this was the day that marked the official surrender of the Nazi German forces in, uh, in Europe during World War II. In fact, uh, it was known as VE Day which was victory in Europe. 
And that day is commemorated as May 8, 1945. It was on that day that people heard for the first time that the war in Europe was over. There were many countries that had been under Nazi and German occupation that now celebrated this good news because they were free. It, for, for many European nations, this was a day longed for and dreamed about. This was indeed good news, for it meant freedom. It meant peace. It meant victory. It meant the defeat of tyranny. And for those who lived under Nazi occupation, one can only imagine how they felt. Imagine when they first heard the news that the war was over. Maybe you, some of you sitting here may have experienced that feeling of hearing for the first time when the war that may have taken place in your country or around you was over and how you felt. Our scripture that we just read in the book of Revelation comes to capture actually this same exact sentiment. You can hear in these words, these, these words, this passage of scripture, if you're, if you, if you're a good Seventh-day Adventist, you know that these words are the beginning of what we understand as the what? Oh, I hear some good Adventists out there. We know it as the beginning words of those three angels' messages. In fact, those three angel messages are, are at the very root and foundation of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. It was those, those early pioneers, those early Adventists, that, that they saw themselves in this text. They, they saw themselves, for John says, he sees an angel flying in the midst of heaven. And, and if you read through your Bible and you, and you do the study, you recognize that an angel can recognize, be, be seen as a supernatural being, but also a messenger. And, and they saw themselves as this messenger. They saw themselves as this angel. And they knew that, that this angel, this, these three angels' messages was their message to proclaim to the world. And the only reason why that you and I are sitting here coming from different cultures and language and people groups and, and is because they took this message seriously because they understood it was that everlasting gospel that would be preached to those on the earth from every nation and tribe and tongue and people. It's because they took that seriously that you and I are here. Because this work started in the northeastern, the New England part of the United States. Small band of people, Americans, in a certain part of the United States, not even all of the United States. They were a small minority group, but they took this seriously, and in their minds they said, though we will be small, like John, they had a vision of something greater. That this message, this message of the everlasting gospel will go to Korea. It would go to Tonga. It would go to Japan. It would go to parts of China. Go to Indonesia. It would go to the Samoans, the Samoan Islands. I know I probably left somebody out. Philippines, Philippines for sure. Yes. It would go to these places, to Thailand, to, to all of these places all across the Asian Pacific. This small group of people, they understood this for every nation, language, kindred, tongue, and people. And so John sees this in vision, and they capture themselves in this vision. And this messenger is preaching about Jesus for everybody in the world to hear. He is preaching the eternal gospel or the everlasting gospel. This is our heritage, folks. This is our heritage. 
this everlasting gospel. But I want to just tell you today that, that we sometimes mis are misinformed about what the word gospel means. So I want to say this as we talk about, we won't talk about all three of those angels' messages. You know them very well. But I want to suggest to you today that if you do not understand the first angel's message, the other two messages will not make sense. Hear me, let me say it again so, so you can hear me. If you do not understand the power of the very first angel's message, before you get to the idea of Babylon being fallen and the wrath coming and all of these things of judgment, you will have missed what our main mission is. For in that first message, all of my theologians, all my pastors in here, you know this. In that very first message is the everlasting gospel. It is that preaching of the everlasting gospel to anybody who will hear it. But I want to tell you that in order to understand that first message, you have to understand what is mean by the gospel. For, for words, often sometimes they, they change their meaning over time, especially Bible words over more than 2,000 years ago. You can ask Christians today what they might claim that the gospel is, and they'll say that it, it refers to the biblical message about how you and I are saved. Yes, that's true. For many Christians, the gospel refers to God's plan to save me, to forgive my sins, and to take me to heaven without my deserving it. And we refer to, refer to this as justification by faith through grace. And these are certainly important biblical doctrines. And you could say that the message about my personal and your personal salvation is part of the gospel. But I've got news for you today. The gospel is much more than that. It's much more than just your salvation or my salvation. So let me break it down for, for you. The English word that we use, that we get the word gospel, actually comes from the Greek word. Uh, uh, the Greek word. What did I say? The Greek what? It's a Greek word. And the Greek word is euangelion. I would have you try to pronounce that, but your languages are a lot more difficult than that. Now, euangelion, probably if you see it written, you'll recognize it's the, it's the same word transliterated that we get the idea of evangelism. Euangelion is the word that we get the word evangelism. You've heard the word evangelism before. But euangelion literally means good news. Somebody say good news. It literally means good news good news but it was not used about just any kind of good news now there's all you know if you watch the news at 11 o'clock 10 o'clock whenever you watch the news on tv you know it's not a lot of good news a lot of bad news but you and I know that there is also good news. So, so there's good news. Like if you got a raise on your job, that would be good news. If you got a good uh, health report, that would be good news. If you were able to finally purchase that house that you've been trying to purchase and it finally went through, that would be good news. And you would share that. So there's all kinds of good news. But, but here's where it gets really interesting. I hope you're with me. I hope you're listening. The good news that it was shared from a Roman and Greek thinking was not just the kind of good news that I've just referred to. It was a very specific type of good news. It was a very different type of good news. It was actually a technical political term which meant good news from the war. Are you with me? It wasn't just any kind of good news, raised on my job, good, healthy. No, no, no. It was good news that the, listen to me now, it was good news that the war was over. Are you hearing me? So, so the Bible, so the Bible is actually in Revelation, surprisingly, using that word euangelion, which we say is good news, in precisely that way. It's not just about all oh, the good news of salvation, although that was important. It 
was really saying the everlasting gospel is the good news. Oh, I hope you're excited about this. Is the good news that the war is over. So what's it trying to say? John saw in vision something that we're waiting for, but he saw it in the present. He saw that Jesus had already won the battle that you and I are in the midst of. Oh, did you catch it? So the everlasting gospel is the idea that Jesus has already won the battle that we're in the midst of. That means that you and I are already victorious in Jesus. That means that the battle has been over, the battle is over, and the war has been won, and Jesus is victorious. So, so when Isaiah 57, it has that passage of scripture. It contains this, this metaphor of a fast runner coming over the hills and arriving in town with a message from the war front. In fact, you remember it, it says, how wonderful it is uh, for those, the, the feet of those who bring good news. Who bring good news. Now, what does it mean that it's a technical term about the battle and the war being over? Well, back in biblical times when there was a war and, and uh, they wanted to tell you about the war, uh, they didn't just show the war on CNN. It wasn't on Fox News. It wasn't on CBS. Um, in, in fact, if, if you want to know what was going on from the war front, what they would have to do is, come on, listen to me somebody today. What they would have to do is, they would have to send a messenger. They would have to send a messenger. And so the picture is that the messenger, when the war was over, would run all the way back to the capital and tell the citizens of victorious, our uh, citizen of the victorious country, guess what? You and Gillian, good news, good news. So what is John trying to see? What is John seeing? John is seeing a people who have an everlasting good news. That's you and me. What are you trying to say? It is trying to say, it is trying to say that you and I are like messengers in the world telling people that Jesus has already won. And he is victorious over death. He is victorious over sickness. He is victorious over brokenness. He is victorious over crime. He's victorious over war and strife and pestilence and hunger and poverty and sickness and death. Jesus has already won. And you and I are the messengers to tell everybody in the world that Jesus has won. Therefore, we are called to be messengers of the good news. We're not to sit on the good news. We are to run with the good news. Come on and say amen, somebody out there. We are to run with the good news. So, so when you have good news, if you don't take and run with it, you have not done your job. Because we're waiting on you to go out there and tell somebody the good news that the war is over. The battle has been won. That's hard, isn't it? Especially when you're in a place where you're like, well, wait a minute. People are still dying. There's still sickness. There, there's still death. But, but, but Jesus understood this when he said, a person who dies in me, it is though a person who believes in me, it is though they never die. Hey, are you hearing me? Jesus understood because he was saying, when I came into this world I ushered in my kingdom and my kingdom has won now here's the part here's the part that gets me every time we you and I live between the already and the not yet that's weird isn't it we we live between what Jesus has already brought 
And then we're in the middle of that waiting for what is to come when he shall consummate his victory. Are you with me? That's why we are Adventists. Huh? That's why we're Adventists. We're looking forward to that great consummation. Now, we're in the, we're in the uh, uh, phase right now where oh, most of Christianity is celebrating not the second advent, they're celebrating the first advent. And we celebrate that too. That's why you see all of these decorations and everything, right? We celebrate the first advent as well. But it makes us adventists. It makes us look forward to the coming. And so, and so, you should understand the first, I hope, I'm, I hope you're understanding this, the first phase of that battle that has been won was, guess what? When Jesus showed up as a baby. That was the first blow. That's why before he could grow up, the devil tried to kill him. You got it? The first blow in the war was Jesus coming as a baby. Now, you know what's wonderful about Christmas? Because I, I hope you'll understand if I say this. I think in some ways, I think in some ways if, if God was going to come and try to reconcile this world and win this great controversy and win this war, I'm not sure it was a good idea to have a baby first. You understand what I'm saying? Think about it. It's not really the way we would do it, is it? If we were going to try to win a war, we wouldn't start to try to win the war with a baby. Am I the only one here thinking about that? Is that... Right? I mean, right? Is that the way you would do it? Hey, we're going to go to battle. Yeah, let's, let's get a baby. That, right? That's what you celebrate and call Christmas. Is that God says, I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to win this great controversy. And I'm going to do it with a baby. Oh, I like that. Because you know what that tells me? That God is so awesome. God is so powerful. God said, I will use the small things to uproot the big things. I will use the foolish things to confound the wise. And so when you think I'm going to do one thing one way, I'm going to do it another way because he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So if you don't miss anything else, understand this. Christmas, the whole Christmas season, ought to remind you that God's ways are not your ways. That God has a plan that will defy your logic. Oh, that helps me because I'm always trying to tell God how to do his business. Amen. Sometimes my prayer is more telling God what to do than asking God what I should do. And so, but, but, but Christmas reminds me that God's got a plan that's bigger than my logic because his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my ways. And he says, I'm going to win this war and I'm going to start with a baby. I think God does some special things. I hope you understand if I say it this way. I think God just is so awesome. Sometimes he just shows off, doesn't he? Huh? He just does it in a way that, that, that you couldn't imagine. Because he says, if you thought that was good, let me show you this. You thought it was something when I opened up the Red Sea? Yeah, that was fine. But I will win the whole world by, by, becoming, by becoming a human being living and dying on the cross. That even in my defeat, there'll be victory. Oh, thank you, Lord. In my defeat, there'll be victory. That is the word. That is the message that you and I are to share. We are to take that good news to all the world and let them know the battle is won. You and I are already victorious. So the only way that we move on in faith, you know the way we move on in faith is we don't worry about any obstacle. Yeah, there was a pandemic, yep, and there were casualties. There were casualties, let's, let's, not, let's not confuse that, right? We lost some people along the way because of it. But it did not unmoor our faith because we know there's one who's bigger than the pandemic. And he has seen us through. He sees his church through. And so we move on in faith because we know in whom we believe. We believe in the one who has already won the battle. 
and our king is the only one who can bring an everlasting peace and righteousness and finally remove all evil and suffering and pain and sadness from this world and with his help we will begin to transform this world from evil to goodness right now one kind and loving action at a time all the work that you and I do in our churches it is to remind the world and let the world know that Jesus reigns now and our king is coming he has not been defeated he's waiting to come and to take his people home and so go out and tell your family members and friends the good news this is what evangelism is all about recruiting loyal subjects to the awesome king and expanding his kingdom it is about moving the whole world towards glorifying and worshiping god tell your neighbors and your co-workers the good news that jesus christ is lord tell everyone you come in contact with the good news that our god king jesus reigns he has won the battle and we celebrate his sure victory for he is one it is the good news the good news that we're not to keep to ourselves we're not to just enjoy it in our churches we must tell our neighbors and friends we must tell our community members we must tell them this good news we must we must make disciples for Jesus Christ so that Jesus can soon come I'm looking for him to coming again soon aren't you I want to see him don't you I believe that day is coming I believe that day is close when we shall see him crack through the skies and we will say lo this is our God we have waited for him and he has come to save us that's good news Amen.